Okay, Gus VL750, let's play E4. And I wanna see how our initial set of, oh, okay, never mind. We're facing an Alakine. The move, of course, is E5, and I know y'all know that. So you play E5, Knight D5, you play D4. And in this critical position after D6, there are eh, three or four viable setups that you can play. Uh, you can play Knight F3, which for a while was considered the topical move. The old main line is c4, and then chasing the knight away, and then taking on d6. And then, in my opinion, the line that you want to play if you want to be a main line player who tries to punish people for bad openings, if you want to be someone who people fear, you play the Fantasy against the Karakhan, you play, you know, Smithmore against Sicilian, and you play the Four Pawns attack against the Alakine. It's not that hard to learn. There isn't that much theory. And in return, you get essentially the chance to blow black off the board. So I think I've already played it a couple of times in the speedrun. All right, so knight c6. This is the, the, the main line. And if you know nothing about the four pawns attack, you would be tempted to play knight f3 here. Knight f3 is a bad move. Knight f3 walks right into black's hands because it allows the move bishop g4, which puts pressure on the knight, which in turn puts a lot of pressure on the d4 pawn. So you don't want to play knight f3. You also don't want to play knight e2 because that blocks the bishop and blunders c4. The way that you want to defend the pawn without allowing a pin is the move bishop e3, which is... No, you don't want to go d5 here because d5 blunders the e5 pawn. And after bishop f5, you essentially want to delay the move knight f3 for as long as possible. You want to develop your other pieces first. So first we develop the other knight. And essentially notice the black's bishop has already moved, which makes it safe for us to now play knight f3. Now, believe it or not, bishop g4 is a move here. Uh, it's so annoying that black even sometimes plays it down a tempo, but now that we've developed our other pieces and now that we have d4 under better control, bishop g4 is no longer that dangerous. Okay, so now we complete our development with bishop e2. Both sides castle. We're following right now the main line and uh, black plays f6. You might remember this from my game against Robson in the U.S. Championship, my round one game, where I had this from the black side. Now, white is better here. And essentially, the reason that white is better is connected to the fact that we have better better central control. Black has a, a backward pawn on e6, and we have very nicely positioned pieces. I mean, look at how everything is in the center. Everything is very compact. And we want to make a couple of surface level improvements to our position. This is still theory, so it's not like I'm inventing this. The first improvement that we want to make is to connect our rooks. And uh, yeah, connect our rooks and prepare to put them essentially on c1 and d1. So we want to throw in the move queen d2. And it looks like this is where our opponent's theoretical knowledge ends. This is one of those positions a lot of people struggle in because there's no super concrete plan. You just have to make a bunch of improving moves. Okay, so he plays bishop g4, which to be honest, I'm not familiar with. I think I understand what the point is. The point is, is he wants to take on f3 and then take on d4. So we need to respond accordingly by protecting the d4 pawn. And the move that makes the most sense is rook ad1. Notice that if black takes on f3 anyway, we would want to take back with the rook. A very common blunder in the Alakine is people who automatically take back with the bishop and blunder the c4 pawn. But notice that the knight is exerting pressure on that pawn. We have to keep the bishop on e2 for the time being, until we play b3, that is. Okay, queen e7. Now, the other drawback of the move bishop g4 that, that he just played is that it relinquishes the e4 square. And why is that important? That is quite important because we can play the move knight e4 at some point. We can even play it now. In fact, I think we will play it now. And... Why is knight e4 a good move? Well, knight e4 is a good move because it pressures the bishop on f6. And I think that we do want to trade bishops, uh, trade the bishop, because if we trade the bishop, then d4 is no longer under pressure. And we can then essentially get our hands free from the necessity to defend our central pawns. That makes sense. So we want to play knight e4, and then we want to take on f6 at our convenience. I would not move the rook from the f file, miniature case, because if we move the rook from the f file, then we open the doors for bishop takes f3, and we would have to take back with the pawn, which is highly undesirable, in order to keep c4 protected. Is a3 too passable? a3 is completely unnecessary. I'm not sure what a3 accomplishes. Bishop takes f3. Okay, so now we have a choice. We have to decide whether we take on f6 first, because that's a check, or do we play rook takes f3? Well, let's calculate. If we take on f6 first, the issue with that is that black will, will take back with a rook. 
And do you see what the problem is? The problem there is that after rook takes f3, rook takes f3, again, we have to take back with the pawn and ruin our kingside pawn structure. Again, we can't take back with the bishop because c4 is going to be hanging. So we should take first on f3. The f6 bishop is not going anywhere because bishop h4 can always be met with g3. And in general, bishop h4 is not a scary move. That bishop is just really, really, really bad. Why is the c... I mean... Why is any pawn important, right? The c4 pawn is the center pawn. We don't just want to give it away for free. h6. All right, so let's not rush with knight takes f6 check. That bishop, as we have already established, isn't really going anywhere. So it's worthwhile to put a little bit more pressure on that bishop before we capture it. What move comes to mind? A very typical move, right? This is all very natural. What move comes to mind? Yeah, the move rook d to f1. The rook on d1 has essentially done its job as a protector of d4. Now we can leave those duties to the bishop and the queen. And after rook d8, our opponent completely misses the danger here. Now we are ready to take on f6. This is really the last moment at which we can do it, otherwise we lose d4. But the point of rook df one is that black can no longer keep his kingside pawn structure intact. We can definitely, we definitely want to trade rooks here. And we force this extremely weakening move, g takes f6. Now, it's not the end of the game, because bishop takes h6 allows black to take on d4. And in general, we have to be very, very careful in order to not lose this d4 pawn. So let's try to find a good move in this position. Okay, well, how should we think about this position in general? Well, it's, it's quite clear that our general strategy uh, should be to attack the king. The king is wide open. We should try to attack it. What tools are available at our disposal as a way to develop an attack against the Black King? Well, there's a very kind of typical attacking motif that comes to my mind, uh, which is a rook lift, right? You notice that after g takes f6, the g file is open. So it makes a lot of sense, I think, to get a rook to g3, and that would greatly increase the strength of a move like bishop takes h6. The queen should be kept on d2 for the time being. I don't want to give up d4 until we are ready to do so, until we're essentially ready to deliver checkmate. Because the best way to give black a lot of counterplay is to allow knight takes d4 and open up the d file. Knight e5, paper tiger. That doesn't do anything at all. How should we respond to that move? Should we take the knight? Well, no, we shouldn't take the knight because our queen is pinned. Now, you would start by looking for ways to move the queen away with check, but there is no such way. And once you realize there is no such way, you also have to notice that the rook is hanging, so... Best thing to do is just to move it to g3 with check. Now, how has knight c6 to e5 changed the position? Well, the knight is no longer exerting pressure on d4, which means that d4 has now two defenders and only one attacker, which means that the bishop or the queen, at least one of these pieces, is free to roam about the cabin. What does that mean? That means that we are ready to take on h6, and we're threatening a totally devastating check on g7. We're threatening queen f4. The game is essentially over. So we have fully dismantled the setup. It's not 100% over if black defends well, but knight f7 further exacerbates the situation by clearing the g7 square for our bishop. Now it's basically over. Okay, king h7. So we have one last line of defense that we need to break down. And the line of defense we need to break down, first of all, notice that queen h6 is impossible because there's a knight on f7. So one approach would be to try to eliminate that knight and play bishop h5. But that's a little bit slow. The other move that comes to mind is bishop d3 check. Bishop d3 check looks almost like checkmate, but black can block the check with f5. But in that position, I think, to the rescue comes a very typical attacking motif, right? You want to crash through. If you can somehow take twice on f5, you're going to force the king back to g8, and the king is going to be forced to walk right into a devastating discovery. So we have one more piece that's not involved in the attack yet, and that's the queen. We want to involve the queen. Where should we go with it? Well, there are multiple ways we can play. We can play queen e2, which is a great move, going to h5. We can also play queen f4 to set up a sacrifice on f5 and also aim at the h4 square in case black's queen, let's say, shifts to d7. So I think both queen e2 and queen f4 are essentially winning on the spot. Um, let me think for a second which one I would prefer. Yeah, let's play queen f4. That was my original plan. 
Very straightforward attacking play. Notice that we're not doing anything insane. We're not sacrificing all of our pieces. We're just identifying uh, a way forward and then setting it up. We're also bringing all of the pieces into the attack. Knight d6. Now, as is very common when you're attacking, every one of your opponent's move, you have to ask yourself which squares are now opened up for your pieces because one door closes, another door opens, and if you do that, then you very quickly identify the best moves. That's a good technique in positions where your opponent's king is wide open and there are, there are a lot of infiltration squares. So knight moves away from f7. What squares are opened up? Well, the h6 square is opened up. So we give a check. And then we step back with a bishop and we win a queen. And we win the game. Pretty simple chess, right? So you can see how, how effective the four pawns attack is at this level. In general, if you know openings at this level, you, you get a huge advantage. So f4, d, e, f, e. Uh, we followed the main line for a while. We followed the main line for a while. f6, e, f, bishop, f6. And, um, okay, so queen d2. Now, in this position, if memory serves me right, black's best move is queen d8 to e7. Like, in order for black to keep an acceptable position, they've got to know uh, very, you know, reams of theory. Just because the position is so, like, positionally dubious. So, no, the allocan's actually not that bad if you know it very well. It's definitely dubious. It's definitely objectively worse for multiple reasons, but if you know it very, very well, and my good friend Brian Tillis, who's a national master, he's done a chessable course on the Alakine. So at like a 16, 1700 le uh, level, it's it's a pretty decent chess opening if you know all of the ins and outs of the main lines. But the problem, as I've already explained many times, is that people tend to play these openings without really knowing them. They're just kind of experimenting. And they get away with it at their level, but they never really get acceptable positions because they're just kind of winging it all the time. And then they think the opening itself is terrible. So queen e7 is the main line. And here, uh, this was my game against Ray. Uh, the most popular move in this position, this is a great example of when the most popular move is actually not the best. Which sometimes happens, right? The most popular move in a position isn't always a good move. Sometimes people uh, just reach a position and none of them have studied the position conscientiously with an engine, for example. And so they tend to make the same mistake over and over again. Uh, and the mistake that people tend to make in this position over and over again is... Let me just make, verify that I'm telling the truth. And Ray did not make this mistake. Uh, so rook ad1, rook ad8, sorry, it's not this position. Rook ad1, rook ad8, it's this position. So clearly there is an x-ray against the queen. And the main move, uh, logically enough, is queen d2 to c1, moving the queen, stepping back away from the x-ray. d4 is well protected by three different pieces, and it's attacked by three pieces, so it cannot be captured. But it turns out that queen c1 is a mistake that allows black to equalize, and it's so much more popular than the second move. Yeah, and Ray's move, which is extremely rare, but the best move in the position, is king g1 to h1. There's a very specific purpose to this move, which totally disarms Black's main idea. Why is queen c1 wrong? The reason it's wrong is because Black has e5. Now, e5 itself looks like a completely innocuous move on account of d5. And this pushes the knight back, and white just has an amazing center and an amazing position. But there's a very, very nice idea here. Black can play the move knight d4, sacrificing a pawn. Okay, well, white says, thank you very much. Knight takes d4, he takes d4, bishop takes d4, and it seems like black has absolutely absolutely no follow-up. You might say, oh, what about takes, takes, and queen c5, trying to pin the rook? Well, that's not very effective, because white can just play queen e3, I think, or even queen d2, and there is no way to put more pressure on the rook. So the compensation here is insufficient. You might say, oh, there's a four, queen e3 check. That's a Bota's gambit. So there is nothing in this position, but here you don't have to take on d4, and you can play this very crafty move, bishop g5. Bishop g5 in this position. All of a sudden, the queen is in some trouble. The queen has no good squares. It has to move all the way down to a1. It has to move all the way down to a1. And after queen a1, black strikes again out of the clear blue sky with a move c7, c5, hitting the bishop. 
And the idea is that if white takes on Passant, there is a very easy tactic. Rook takes d4 and then bishop, t bishop e3 check, picking up the rook and winning a piece. So again, white is pushed back even further with bishop f2. And now comes the main idea of this entire operation. Without this next move, white preserves the extra pawn and consolidates and everything is great. Who can try to find black's best move in this position? The only move that keeps the initiative going. It's really the only move that creates a threat. Yeah, it's bishop c2. Bishop c2 attacking the rook. But the interesting bit is that after rook d e1, uh, a lot of you, I'm positive, are thinking, oh, it's bishop d2 trapping the rook on e1. But in fact, that is not the move. That is not the move. Um, because if you play bishop d2, then white has bishop g4. Bishop takes e1, rook takes e1, and white counter-sacrifices in exchange, but gets a huge initiative in return for it. This position is bad for black. For example, like queen d6, you give a check on e6, and then you go bishop g3, and black's pieces are shoved all the way back, and black is in huge trouble. Queen c1, queen e3 is coming. This is no good for black. But the move here is actually rook takes f2. And there are still uh, two, there are actually two correspondence games that follow this line. One of them from, from 2003, rook takes f2, rook takes f2. And bishop e3, and black gets a huge initiative in return for the for the sacrificed pawn, and the computer's evaluation here is equal. So this entire line is the reason why the most popular move, which is queen c1, is actually a mistake, and that's not a very well known detail. If you're an Alakine player, uh, this is something that you should definitely memorize and definitely know very very well. And so for that reason, you want to play king h1. Well, how does king h1 help? Well, the reason it helps is if black goes down the same line and goes knight d4, takes, 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 bishop g5. First of all, the queen used to be on c1, which would mean it had to go to a1. Now it can go back to e1 and stays relevant. And black has none of the ideas connected with rook takes f2, connected with bishop e3 check. Bishop e3 is no longer a check. The king is so much safer on h1 than it is on g1. So you can play bishop c2 here, but that's not going to do anything. Rook a1 and white is totally fine. White is up a full pawn. Um, so after king h1 in my game against Robson, I ended up playing just sort of a neutral move. I played... I mean, I knew that he would probably play king h1. I knew that that was the best move. Uh, but I didn't last very long because black is just worse here. I played h6, he played h3. And only after rook d7 did ray go back to c1. And the inclusion of king h1 makes e5 totally ineffective. And without this idea, black's position just kind of sucks. And I quickly ran out of helpful moves to make and ended up losing in very one-sided fashion. You can find an analysis of that game on my YouTube channel. So, yeah. This was a classical game. This was round one of the U.S. Championship in, in October. So, this was not that long ago. All right. So bishop g4, to my knowledge, is already an inaccuracy because it allows this knight to get to e4 and pressure the bishop. After rook a d1, queen e7, knight e4, black is already in quite a bit of trouble, I think. Black is already in quite a bit of trouble because we're exerting pressure on the bishop. Uh, remember that black's position is already bad to begin with just because of this backward pawn on e6 and the awkward knights. So this only add in, adds insult to injury after bishop f3, rook f3. And I think that the last chance for black uh, was after h6, rook df1, to just kind of bite the bullet and go back to d7. You have to defend this bishop. You cannot allow white to take and take back with the pawn because the king is just too, too weak there. After knight d7, black is still holding on. The position sucks for many, many reasons. White has many ways to improve the position. But okay, at least black is, black is still in the game. Maybe a3, and before expanding on the queen side is a good idea. We would have to think here. Maybe we would want to take the bishop anyway, and just get two bishops for two knights. But in any case, this would have allowed black to stay in the game. Yeah, rook a d8, knight f6, the game is over. Takes, takes, takes. And now very important move, rook f3. How do I find a move like this? Well, you just evaluate how the position has changed as a result of the change in pawn structure. And... You should notice that the king is now wide open, 
And you should quantify that. What does it mean for the king to be wide open? Well, when, when you say those words, what you really mean is that the G file is now open. That there is a direct line of fire, a direct avenue that allows you to reach the king. And from there, it's very easy. Once you understand that the G file is the way to go, then you spot the rook lift. Rook f3, 95, rook g3 check. No, I think quantify is what I meant in that case. Rook g3 check, and then bishop takes h6. Quantify as in operationalize, make something more concrete. It's not enough just to say, oh, the king is open, I need to attack it. In what way is the king wide open? And then, once the attack rages on, we play bishop takes h6, we find bishop g7 check, and then we find bishop d3 and queen f4, aiming to sacrifice on f5 and drive the king back to g8. What if he runs with the king toward the center? Yeah, there were many, many good moves. And I say this every single time. When we have a crushing position like this, if you're asking a question about an alternative or you're wondering why I didn't play something else, chances are that your move is also good. There usually isn't just one winning line in these types of positions. There was a question about the king running toward the center. Well, the king will not get very far. If the king goes to f8, we take on h6. And now there are multiple, multiple ways to win. But what I like to do in such positions, when the queen and the king are uh, in close proximity like this, you need to start looking for skewers. So the simplest move is just rook g8 check. If the king moves to d7, you have a skewer, but you can also just take the knight with check because the, the pin is no longer there. The king is has stepped in front of the rook. And if the king goes back toward f7, then you go rook g7 and win the queen. This is part of the idea that I've shared many times, which is that when you're attacking, you have to look at ways to win material. Sometimes the conclusion of the attack isn't always checkmate. It can just be using the weakness of the opponent's king to win a ton of material. And that's basically all she wrote. A simple game, but I think a, a pretty nice one. Bishop d3, queen f4, and then once the knight moves away, we notice that h6 is now free for the taking, and we sink our queen there. Pretty straightforward stuff.